Psalm chapter 1. As you know, this is the Psalm of David. You know, David wrote approximately 75% of the Psalms. And you had other authors. You had Asa. You have a bunch of other folks. Even Moses wrote one, Psalm 90. And, and so these are some great Psalms. The, the Psalms were, were the hymn book for the nation of Israel. And they would take these particular songs and, and, and put music to them. And, and these are great, great psalms. They, 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 incredible. Whatever it is you're going through in life, you can find a psalm that will meet you right there. And it's just good to be able to go through the psalm. So we're going to look at Psalm 1. For those of you who love titles, is how to live a blessed life. How to live a blessed life. We think that this blessed life is something that is automatic. And I, and I believe that David is going to show us some things here. He's going to show us those who are blessed, some things that they do and some things that they don't do. And there are some things he's going to talk about. The first part is negative and the second part will be positive. And he's going to share some things with us, and you're going to see whether you're living the blessed life or not. And I believe, I'm so glad David penned this psalm and God put it upon his heart to do it. Look what he says there in verse 1. We're going to, we're going to look at this psalm, we're going to pick it apart, and we're going to dissect it, and we're going to have some fun. Notice he says, blessed is the man, stop right there. See, you thought we were going to read some more, didn't you? Blessed is the man. Uh, Esher is the Hebrew word for uh, blessed. It means happiness. It means contentment. It almost has a similar meaning to in the New Testament uh, that, that the, the Beatitudes in Psalm 5, you know, blessed is the man and blah, 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 blah. It almost has, almost has the same meaning. In the New Testament, makirios is the, is the Greek word. It means happiness or contentment. Or in um, Ephesians 1, 3, when it says, talks about the blessed man, this man will be blessed and blessed in heavenly places. That's eulogia is where we get our English word eulogy from. It means to speak well of. But here, the Hebrew word is esher. It means happiness or contentment. So happy or content is the man who does what? Notice, who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. The first thing we see is that the blessed man, he's not walking in the counsel of the ungodly. Let's just back it up a little bit. The blessed man is walking. It said that Adam walked with God in the cool of the day. Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. Abraham, God said, walk before me and be blameless. We see that the walk, David, yea, though I walk. Through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. We're talking about the walk. The Christian life is a walk. Sure, it's a run. We run too, but walk speaks of a continuous action. It's not like we are walking, then we sit down for a minute. No, it speaks of continuous action. It means progress. You're walking somewhere. It speaks of purpose. You're going somewhere. The Bible talks about this walk shall walk and not grow weary in Isaiah and walk before me be blameless in Amos walk humbly with your God and we see constantly we're encouraged to walk with God but there's a certain way so walk humbly with your God you can't walk with God and be cocky and be arrogant you can't bring pride into the presence of God. You got to walk before him humbly. Walk humbly with your God. So it's talking about the walk. Even in the New Testament, it speaks of a walk. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Do you always got to see it? Are you spiritually from Missouri? The show me state. Well, you just always got to see it. But the Bible talks about us walking. Walk by faith and not by sight. We, 
we, we, this Christian life is just that. It is a walk. The Bible says walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill, fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's a walk. walk. All through the scripture, walk, a walk. So the question is, how is your walk? How is your walk with the Lord today? How would you evaluate your own walk? <laughs> the Bible says in Proverbs 20, verse 6, every man will proclaim each his own goodness. If I was to ask you how your walk with the Lord, you would lie to me and tell me it's all good when you know it's not good. You know, oh yeah, my walk with the Lord is great. How's your walk? If you want to live a blessed life, your walk has to be right. Blessed is the man, oh, how happy and content. Oh, Paul reminded us. Paul said in Ephesians 4, as you were, Philippians 4, he says, uh, 411, he says, I have learned how to be content. I learned how to be a base. I learned how to abound. He says contentment is something that's learned. And so if, if this Hebrew word, esher, means happiness or contentment when, when we walk with the lord there's a happiness and there's a contentment that we have with, with, with walking with the lord and so blessed is the man who walks watch this who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly oh we have to talk about this especially in today's time that we're living in what counsel are you walking in right now Nowadays, we fail to realize that, hey, people know more about uh, uh, Freud and Maslow and Jung more than they know Peter, James, and John. Nowadays, even in the church, we hear people talking about you got to get in touch with your inner child and all kind of mess like that. And they know more about that. Hey, let me tell you something. Psychology came along in 1934 as an alternative to Christianity. Because you got to realize the soul is God's business. The original definition of psychology is the study of the soul. But the etymology of that word changed to the study of human behavior. No, the real definition is the study of the soul. The soul is God's business. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. The soul is God's business, and man has tried to take it to make it his business. But the soul, the psyche, that's God's business. God is the one, David said, that restores my soul. Oh, poor David and poor Isaiah and Ezekiel who didn't have psychology or someone's couch to lie on, to talk to about their problems. They went to God. David said, God is the one who restores my soul. I know many of you, you can't go to a higher learning of education without studying psychology. That's just how the world is. The world has just duped us. And now, what used to be an alternative to Christianity is now the norm. Now you go to Christian universities and you study psychology. And now they're saying you can marry the two together. Now I just say the devil is a liar. You can't marry the two together. I don't care what they say. I'm going to stick to the word. It says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Everyone is walking according to some counsel. This is why I'm so thankful for Calvary Chapels that we're going to teach the whole counsel of God. This is what Acts 20, verses 27 and 28 says. Paul says, I am free from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. And if God's word is God's word from Genesis to Revelation, then we're going to teach it all. They say God's word is anointed from Genesis to the maps, to the back of the book. Amen. So we see that the blessed man, to live a blessed life, we're not going to walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Hey, when trouble comes your way, and it will come your way, who do you go to for counsel? Who do you go to for counsel? And whoever you're listening to, that's what you're walking in. You're walking in that counsel. 
oh, I know what I'm saying is not popular with a lot of folks. But, you know, <laughs> since when I'm going to say that which is popular? I'm going to say that which is biblical. And the soul is God's business. And there are many of you that are walking in the counsel of the ungodly. You have no clue what the Bible says. But you have a clue of what Sigmund Freud had to say about stuff. And he was a pervert. Oh, just look up the history about how little boys did liking his mother and all kind of, he was a pervert. Freud was a pervert. Look it up, look the history up. Today he's revered, ooh, he was a pervert to come up with some of those thoughts and ideas and things. I know you got an A and a B out of that class, I know you did, but still. So blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. You cannot be walking in the ways of God or you cannot have a great walk with the Lord if you're walking in the counsel of the ungodly. Notice what else he says, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. I want you to watch this. He's walking, standing, and sitting. He's walking in the counsel of the ungodly. That wasn't enough. He's going to stand in the path of sinners, and then he will sit in the seat of the scornful. There's a couple of people that reminds me of this. One is Peter. We always picking on Peter. Peter going to get us when we get to heaven. <laughs> he said, man, you always dogging me down there, you know. I said, you did stupid things for us to dog you on. You know, we're going to have that conversation when we get up there. But he says, who walks not in the counsel of God, nor stands in the path of sinners. So if you're walking in the counsel of the ungodly, you will stand in the path of sinners. It gives the connotation of sinners trying to come to the Lord and you're in the pathway. You're going to keep them from coming. We're supposed to be the ones who walk in with God and showing them the way. This is the way, walk in it. This is the way to get to God, and we're standing in the path of sinners. And if that's not good enough, we're going to sit in the seat of the scornful. Those who are mocking God, we sit and we, we don't mock God, but we just kind of laugh with them. <laughs> And they're mocking God but, and saying jokes and inappropriate things. And we, we don't rebuke them. We don't lovingly rebuke. We just, <laughs> we, <laughs> we, we don't want to offend anybody. And that's the big thing today. We are just ridiculous as a society. Everybody's so touchy-touchy and so, oh, I'm offended. Get over yourself. I tell folks, you're a mess. Everybody just touchy, touchy, moody. And, and, but see, everybody is so sensitive can be offended, but you can offend the Christian all day long, and nobody cares about that. And I get on them about that. I say, oh, well, I'm offended too. We're all going to be offended. Let's just sit and be offended together. It's a mess. This world is a mess. It needs the Lord. We know that. But we cannot walk in the counsel of the ungodly and stand in the path of sinners or sit in the seat of the scorn. For like I said, it reminds me of Peter. When Jesus was arrested and they were doing their thing with Jesus, it said that Peter kind of, he just kind of went to where they were and he just kind of stood there. And then next, you know, we read, that was like in John 18. Then another gospel, it says that he was sitting among the enemies of God by the fire. And we're like, Peter, dude, what are you doing? And that's when they began to say, oh, were you not with him? No, I don't, I don't even know the man. What you talking about? Peter warming himself by the enemy's fire. We cannot warm ourselves by the enemy's fire and not expect to get burned. 
And they said, they said yeah, you were with him. He said, no, I wasn't. Warming himself by the enemy's fire, that's why it was by a fire that Jesus had to restore Peter. Because it was at a fire that he denied him. Here he is sitting among them. Warming himself. Are you hanging out with the people who are mocking God? Are you trying to be warmed and, and get fulfillment by the world's fires? We cannot walk in the council of the ungodly and stand in the path of sinners. And next thing you know, we're sitting in the seat of the scorn. For the other person, it reminds me of his lot. It says in, in Genesis 13, it said that Lot looked and he saw that the fields were green. And he looked at it and he saw Sodom and the fields were green. And he said that it, it was like Egypt. We know Egypt is a picture or type of the world. And, he, and the next thing you know, the Bible says in Genesis 13, then he, he pitched his tent towards Sodom. Oh, he's, he's getting closer. First he looked. Then he pitched his tent. Then next thing you know, we find him sitting in the gates. To sit in the gates at that time means that you're one of the judges of the city. Oh, first he just start off with just looking. Then next thing you know, he got a little closer, he pitched his tent. The next thing you know, we see him in Sodom as one of the judges, sitting in the gates with them. No wonder he lost his testimony. No, no wonder when the Lord told him to get everybody out and he went to his son-in-laws and, and they thought he was just joking. They said, you're just joking. And when we try to warm ourselves by the enemy's fire, the very people that God has called us to reach, we find they would just look at us as a joke. You just, you, you playing, right? Are you serious about this Jesus thing? Dude, you were just with us at the bar. And now you're trying to tell us? See, this is what happens. We can't live a blessed life by walking in the council of the ungodly nor stand in the path of sinners, and nor sit in the seat of the scornful. But I want you to notice something. Notice the conjunction but in verse 2, meaning that what he is about to say is in direct contrast to what he just said. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. So to live a blessed life, you're not going to walk in the counsel of the ungodly. You're not going to stand in the path of sinners. You're not going to sit in the seat of the scornful. But your delight is in the law of the Lord. Oh, I love that. I love it because it reminds me of what Job said in Job 23, verse 12, when Job said, I desire your word more than my necessary food. Job said, I would rather sit and delight in the word of God than eating not just any food. Notice he says my necessary food. That's fruits and veggies and nuts and berries. That stuff y'all like to eat out here. <laughs> you know. You want to get some real food, you come on back where we are. We get some good ribs and some mashed potatoes and, you know, some stuff that's going to stick to your bones, you know. Y'all look at that and say, ooh, is it gluten-free and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Where's the fat-free menu, the skinny menu? You kidding me? We go to a place and we throw down. <laughs> so he said, I desire your word more than my necessary food. He said, I would rather sit and feast upon the word of God than I would to eat those things that are necessary for my physical body. I would rather take care of the spiritual man more so than I would take care of the physical man. This is what he delights in. What do you delight to do? Or well, you may say, I delight to work out. Okay, that's great. That's good but do you desire that more than you desire the word of God? Do you desire 
You can put anything else in that sentence. Do you desire that more than the word of God? Because to live a blessed life, your delight will be, no, it, notice, in the law of God. And notice how often he meditates on it. Notice, and he, in his law, he meditates day and night. The word meditate there, that Hebrew word is a word that, that talks about when a cow chews the cud. When the cow, cow chews the cud, it's chewing, you know, and eats, and, and, you know, and it's chewing, and, just, you know, and then it swallows it, and then throughout the day, it barfs it back up and chews on it some more. You know, you know, make sure it gets all the nutrients and nuggets it needs to get out of that whatever it is he's eating, grass or whatever. So this is how it is. Notice, meditate on the Word of God day and night. A lot of people say, oh, I'm not a morning person. Well, you need to become one. The, the reason why is because notice, if it gives the connotation of when a cow chews the cud, and then he's chewing it and then barfs it up throughout the day and chews on it some more, hey, that will mean you have to feast in the morning in order for you to barf it back up later on in the day and chew on it a little bit more. Some people say, well, you know, I, I'm a night person. I like to just read at night and, you know, well, that's good. That's good. But if you want to live the blessed life, the blessed life, the man who is blessed, who meditates on the word of God day and night. It's not just day. It's not just night. It's not an either or, but it's a both and. Day and night. Oh, this is, we find this throughout the, uh, the, throughout the scriptures. Oh, we see this several times throughout the word of God. And David said in Psalm 63, verse 1, he talked about, Oh, Lord, you're my God early. Shall I seek you? In Psalm 119, 147 and 148, it says, In the night watches I meditate on your word, and early I meditate on your word. The same thing is said in Isaiah 26, verse 9. The same thing talking about meditating on the word of God day and night. Is there this book of the law Joshua 1 8 9 this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth but you shall meditate therein day and night it's, it's, it's throughout the Word of God that this is how we should meditate oh when is it that the children of Israel gathered the manna early in the morning so if you're not a morning person you need to become one because see it's nothing like getting the word of God before you leave out for the day. I just wonder, I just wonder. I just wonder, watch this. Satan came to Jesus in Matthew 4 and Luke 4. He came to Jesus to tempt him. We know those three temptations he came to him on. And I want you to notice each time that Jesus stabbed him with the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. He quoted uh, Deuteronomy 6.13, Deuteronomy 6.10, Deuteronomy 8.3. Notice, that's chapter 6 through 8 of the book of Deuteronomy. A small portion of scripture, a couple chapters. And so I suggest to you that those were the chapters that Jesus was meditating on early. And when he met Satan that day, he was able to use the word, boom, and get, it is written, it is written, it is written. And, I, and he had victory. And it says that after the third time, Satan had to go. And I wonder how many times we were defeated throughout the day that God wanted to give us victory if we took the time to meditate on the word before we left. I wonder how many times we would have been victorious, but we end up being defeated by Satan for that day because we never did get in the word because we say we're not a morning person. I wonder if God wants to give us that word that we need. And I guarantee you the word you meditate on in the morning will be the very thing that you would use to defeat Satan throughout the day. Oh, it happened with Jesus. Why wouldn't it happen with us? 
So you need to become a morning person. And then how is it? Oh, my goodness. We, the average American watches seven to eight hours of TV a day. And we have all those images and things and mess and drama and, and humor that's called comedy shows and movies. We got all this stuff, and then we go to bed on that. But what will happen if the last thing we meditated on at night is the word of God, and the first thing we wake up to is the word of God. You will live a blessed life, and your walk with God will be a blessed one. He tells us right here. And, and notice now he's going to describe it a little bit more, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. In his law does he meditate day and night. Oh, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Oh, really? So the blessed man, the one who meditates on the word of God day and night, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. You got to understand that is a unique tree. A tree planted by the rivers of water has a way of allowing its roots to go down deep. The roots of a tree planted by the rivers of water will go down deep and it will grab onto a rock and it will wrap itself around that rock. And the stability of that tree, it will be shaken but not moved. And that's how we will be when we're meditating on the word of God day and night, we will be like that tree. And we reach our roots down and grab onto the rock. And you know from 1 Corinthians 10, 4, that rock is Christ. And grab on to that rock. Oh, the winds will come, but we won't be moved. We will be as solid as a rock because that's where our roots are. That's what happens. Our roots go down because we meditate day and night on the word of God. And the more we know him, the more we love him. And it goes down and grabs that rock and we are stable, sturdy, like a tree planted by the rivers of water. I love how it says that. And notice it says, and brings forth its fruit in its season. Oh, y'all, y'all don't know nothing about seasons out here. Y'all just got paradise weather year-round, you know. I was hating on you guys last winter when I had to get out and shovel some snow, and, and people were saying, hey, Pastor Tony, it's 80 degrees out here. And I said, ooh, you know, I was, I was sipping on Haterade, and I was just, you know, I just hated you guys out here for that. It says, give forth this fruit in this season. The Bible says that, he, that, that God wants our lives to be fruitful. And that he wants us to bear not just fruit, but much fruit. And that our fruit should remain. But notice it says, bears his fruit in his season. Our lives go through seasons. So often, we don't understand the season that we're in. And, and through sin, we can allow a blizzard and a winter time to come in our lives where God seems distant. He seems cold to us. And, and, and it may not be sin. It could be sin that brings the winter time, but it could be a winter time God has allowed, not because of sin, but he's saying, can you trust me in the winter time when it seems like I'm distant and cold? Can you still trust me? But so often we bring winter in our lives because of sin, but not all, and not in all cases. Then there is fall that we experience where things are falling off our lives. There are people and things and attitudes that God will allow to fall from our lives. And, oh, it, fall can be a beautiful thing. Well, for us it can, you know, back where we are. It's like all of a sudden the leaves starts changing. It's like overnight God takes out a, a, a paintbrush and just starts painting these colors, and it's just an amazing thing. I, I send y'all a picture, you know, so you can, <laughs> you know. And so fall can be beautiful, but at the same time, that there's things and people falling out of our lives because they're no good for us. And, and sometimes people look at fall as, 
as, as a negative thing, and fall doesn't always have to be a negative thing. It can be a beautiful thing. Because there's some things in our lives that are not like Christ, and God will allow them to fall off. Like leaves fall into the ground. Oh, there are some of you that are in springtime. Springtime is when things begin to grow. And things are sprouting in your life, and you're just walking with God. You're understanding the Lord and how things work, and things are growing. That's a beautiful thing where things are growing in your life. Then there's summer where things are hot. And God wants us to be hot on fire for him and sometimes we can allow mess in our lives and next thing you know all of a sudden it's a short summer and fall starts coming in winter but you got to understand the season that you're in do you know the season that you're in the bible says in um second peter 5 8 it says humble yourself in the sight of the lord and he will exalt you in due season. There's a season in our lives where when it comes to promotion and exaltation and all those sorts of things, God has a season by which he will exalt us. And so often we get frustrated because it's not our season. And we get envious because it's someone else's season. It's not your season. Psalm 75 and 6 and 7 says exaltation or promotion neither comes from the east or from the west or from the south. It comes from the Lord. He exalts one and put another down. God is the one that's going to exalt you. Don't, don't try to exalt yourself. James 4.10 says humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. God is the one who exalts. God is the one who lifts up. It, it's just not your season. And so we see that the blessed man, he understands the season that he's in, who brings forth his fruit in his season, and notice whose leaves also shall not wither. You know, God never wants our lives, our, our, the, the leaves in our lives to ever wither. He never wants that. Oh, he will allow it, but he never wants it. Well, you know, I stumble and fall all the time. God, God doesn't want you to stumble and fall all the time. Uh, in 2 Peter 1, verses 8 through 10, God says he wants us to neither be barren nor unfruitful. And then in verse 10, he says that, it, that if we do these things, we shall never stumble. God doesn't want us to stumble. God doesn't want us to be barren and unfruitful. He wants our lives to be fruitful. We're connected to God who is life. And he wants us to be alive. He wants our lives to be alive. And so do you understand the season that you're in? Because when we're in that season, our leaves, our leaves shall not wither. And notice he says, and whatever he does shall prosper. Oh, wow. Whatever he does. When we are delighting ourselves in the law of the Lord, we're meditating on the word of God day and night. We shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that gives forth its fruit in his season, who leaves also shall not wither, and whatever we do is going to prosper. Oh, please don't look at prosperity only in a financial sense. It's not what he's referring to. It can include that, but it's not what he's referring to. Because you remember I quoted Joshua 1, 8, 9. I didn't finish the quote. It says, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest do it according to all that is written therein. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. The person who is prospering and has good success is the person that meditates day and night on the word of God. Day and night on the word. You guys out here, you just, you're in the midst of what we call Calvary land. We don't have K-Wave back there that we can just tune in to and, 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 and hear the electronic seminary going over the airwaves. <laughs> we don't have that. Oh, we got radio, Christian radio station. And, you know, I happen to be on that radio station, but... It's me and there's a couple of national people, but 
<laughs> we don't have K-Way. We, we don't have a plethora. You guys are out here in the midst of where teaching, this is the teaching capital of the world. There's no other place on the planet that has a plethora of churches teaching verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, from Genesis to Revelation. There's nowhere else on the planet that is like this. And you guys are in the midst of it. So you have no excuse. The Bible said to whom much is given, much is required. You have no excuse for not meditating day and night on the word of God. Oh, you get, soon as you get in your car and deal with this horrible traffic that's out there, all you got to do is turn on. You can listen to two or three studies because you're going to be in traffic waiting bumper to bumper for two or three hours. I don't envy you guys for that. I can tell you that. I was told, hey, it'd take you an hour and a half to get there today. I said, oh, boy, let me leave early. And, and somebody faked me out because I, I got here in 40 minutes. And, and it, but I was, I was ready for that traffic. Traffic is horrible out here, y'all. Some of y'all can't drive. <laughs> Just darting in and out, no, no blinker, turn signal, what we call turn, y'all blinker, or, or whatever y'all call that thing. Y'all don't use it, you know. <laughs> Whatever it is. Just dark. And it seemed like the more expensive the car, the less they use it. The next thing I'm behind them, next thing they're doing this. And I'm like, dude, what's, you know, y'all gonna have me lose my religion out here. <laughs> like, dude, what was that move you just did? I, whew. I struggle with y'all sometime out here with that traffic. And he says, he shall bring forth his fruit in his season, and whatever he does shall prosper. And then he's about to contrast the ungodly. The ungodly are not so, meaning they're not like the righteous, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. That's a very interesting analogy. What they would do, and you've been taught well, so you've heard these things, what they would do is they will, you know, get that fork and they will toss the wheat in the air. And the chaff will keep blowing and nothing but wheat will fall down. And they will keep doing it over and over again to all they have is wheat. All the chaff blew away. When you meditate on the word of God day and night, you shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water who bring forth his fruit in his seasons, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever you would do will prosper. But here's the thing. You will not be like the ungodly. The ungodly are like chaff that the wind drives away. They are driven away by every wind and doctrine and movement and teaching, they're blown away. And when you don't meditate on the word of God day and night, you will be blown away just like everyone else is blown away by every wind or doctrine that come into the church. Back where we're from, it's not like it here because you have K-Wave. Back where we're from, people think that they're, they're telling me something good when they say, oh, I just listen to Christian radio all day long. I'm like... Where is your discernment? Some of, that, some of that mess is some mess. And you listening to it, you don't have any filters? What's right or wrong? Because you don't meditate. They don't meditate on the word of God, and they're like the chaff that the wind blows away. Just like it talks about in Ephesians 4.14, that they're carried away by every wind or doctrine. And when people, every, it's in, there are certain churches Whatever wind of doctrine that blows into the church, that church follows it. Those are people that are not being taught the word of God like you guys are. Calvary chapels, we just stay the course. We stay the course. I'm not up late Saturday night. Oh, God, what do you want me to teach your people tomorrow? How about just pick up where I left off last week? That's what I'm going to teach them. The whole counsel of God. Whereas other churches, they, they, you know, it's a topical, different topic every week, or it's a six-week series, and all this kind of stuff. But we, I'm, we're just going to stay the course. And those churches, whatever blows through the church, they find themselves blowing right along with it. 
because they're not a church that's based upon the word of God. Individuals are just like that. When you're not in the word, meditating day and night, you will be blown by every wind of doctrine. You'll be coming up in the church talking about some holy laughter and some weird, goofy stuff that's floating through the church. You can always tell these churches, just let something, just let something blow through the church. And next thing you know, you just sit back and just sit back and watch. Next thing you know, they, they're talking that same talk. Yeah, you know, you just got to claim it. I ain't claiming it. You claim it. Yeah. I'm not sick. <laughs> hey, chew. I'm not claiming that sickness. You're sick. Take some medicine, NyQuil or Benadryl. You're sick. You got a cold, common cold. I ain't claiming that. Stop. Oh. I get weary of that stuff. I get weary of it. But that's how the ungodly, they're driven away like the wind. It says, therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. There, there are two types of judgment that shall take place. For believers, those of us who are believers, we will stand before the Bema seat of Christ. Uh, that is the judgment seat of Christ. Bema means judgment seat. Where we will not be judged for our sin or sins, that was dealt with on Calvary's cross, but we'll be judged by the deeds, the things that we have done in the name of the Lord. They will either be wood, hay, or stubble, or gold, silver, and precious stones. Notice, gold, silver, and precious stones are things that can endure the fire. Wood, hay, and straw, or stubble, old King James, is something that burns with fire. And so when we stand before the Lord and we see his face, I used to think when I was a Christian, when I first got saved, I used to think that, you know, there was a giant conveyor belt and my works went into this giant and went down boom, in this big furnace. And then what came out, oh, that's, those are my rewards. Uh -uh. If you remember in the book of Revelation, it said that Jesus' eyes are like a flame of fire. And when we see him face to face, all those works, those things that we did to be seen, we did it for our glory they will be burned up. And those things that we did for God and for the Lord, they will endure and we will receive a reward for those. Oh, 1 Corinthians 3, 13 through 15 talks about those particular things as well. And so, okay, all right. My wife said I got five minutes, okay. All right, five minutes. All right, and then there's the the great white throne judgment, which is the judgment of all unbelievers. Now, you said, well, if the unbelievers are already in hell, what they need to be judged for? Oh, they need, they're going to be judged for why they're going there, why they're going to stay there. Because see, you have to understand that everyone has eternal life. Now, you say, oh, boy, yeah, I was with you to that statement. Everyone has eternal life. It just depends where you're going to spend it. Everyone has eternal life. Either you're going to spend it eternally in hell or eternally in heaven. Everyone has it. See, once, you, you got to understand, we are body, soul, and spirit. And if our bodies goes to the ground and our spirit or our souls goes to either heaven or hell, dependent upon if we accept the Christ as our Lord and Savior. Well, then Paul tells us, absent from the body is present with the Lord. So we know when we die, even though our bodies will be stretched out horizontal in front of some church or wherever, our spirit is going to go be with the Lord. Absent from the body is present with the Lord. Well, the same thing is true for the unbeliever. Absent from the body will be present in hell. But what about his body? At the great white throne judgment, he will be reunited with his body. His body will be changed to be able to endure hell for all eternity. Just like at the Bema seat of Christ, our bodies will be changed 
in a moment in the twinkling of the eye. Our bodies will be changed so we can endure heaven for all eternity. This is why he says that the ungodly are not so. They're like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. There's two different kind of judgments that will take place. That's why the Bible says in the book of Revelation, the book shall be open. It's an old saying, but it, it, we used to say back in the 80s, God is looking and he's booking. He knows what we're doing and knows why and in what spirit we're doing it in. He knows. So he's looking and he's booking. No one can say, oh, God, you unfair. You know, you, you sent me to hell. That's not right. I, I was good down there. And God would just say, roll them, and the screens would just start. And say, well, wasn't that you right there? Look, look, look at this screen. Gabriel, bring, bring it out, bring, you know, magnify it. Is that, is that not you? That's you right there. Well, see, <laughs> well, see, God, what had happened? <laughs> it, it's just what it is. Okay, no, she said, I got two minutes. Okay, they, they give me enough time to, to, to wrap it up. Okay, all right. And in verse six, the last verse says, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. The Lord knows the way of the righteous. You know why? Because... Uh, Psalm 37, 23 says the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. That's how he knows our ways, our steps. They've been ordered by God. But the way of the ungodly shall perish, shall be unfruitful. So let me just wrap it up with this. How do we lead a blessed life? We lead, we, we lead a, 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 and live a blessed life by not doing something and doing something. We live a blessed life by not walking in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standing in the path of sinners, nor sitting in the seat of the scornful. That's what not to do. But, it's a contrast, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. In his law does he meditate day and night. To live a blessed life, we meditate on the word of God day and night. And then we will see the fruit of that. We will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that gives forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. God wants our lives to prosper. And we only think, okay, yeah, yeah, I can receive that. That means my, my boss can call me in tomorrow and, and, and give me a raise. He might call you in and fire you. What, 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 what kind of prospering is that? Because it might open up to, uh, the door for a better job that God had for you down the road the whole time. And he knew you wouldn't leave that job on your own, so he had to fire you. Oh, y'all don't want to hear that kind of blessing. Okay, all right. All right. That'll be another message. That, that'll, be another, that'll be another message. But may we as his people be a people that live a blessed life where we're not standing in the way of sinners and keeping people from coming to the Lord, warming ourselves by the enemy fire, but we're going to delight ourselves in the law of the Lord. And in his law, does we, we, we will meditate day and 